for coming out to the Road of Sholem Biblical Gardens final lecture, uh, final lecture of the summer season. My name is Julie Arnheim and I am the co-chair of the garden. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jonathan Winkle. Jonathan is a primary care doctor at the Squirrel Hill Health Center, which is a federally qualified health center. He's also medical director of Chatham's PA program, as well as an author, a speaker. He has a website called Healers Who Listen, which stems from his book, Healing People, Not Patients. He also is a not regular, but frequent, et, um, not editor, column writer for the Jewish Chronicle. Jonathan's books will be available tonight for $18. They are also available online. For the Healing Garden, which is the theme of the 2022 season, the garden has put together a beautiful book which is available tonight and in the garden, only in the garden, with images hand drawn by the Botanical Artists Society, the Allegheny Highlands chapter, and each plant lists both a healing part of the plant as well as passages from all three Abrahamic religions because healing amongst our greater families is just as important as healing our own individual bodies, which is part of the topic that Jonathan will be talking about. How do we get our knowledge and how do we heal ourselves and each other? Jonathan? Unless I missed it, Julie didn't mention that we've known each other for upwards of 30 years since we were on the high school newspaper staff together at Taylor Alderdice. So that's the real origin story of how I ended up here. Uh, now I'll tell you the other part of the origin, origin story of how I ended up here. <clears throat> so I am at best a mediocre gardener. I have a grapevine. It was entrusted to me by the previous owners of my house, and it produces enough tart, seedy, conquered grapes for about a dozen jars of jelly every August, despite my neglectful care. Out back, I manage almost despite myself to grow a few cups of grape tomatoes and a few hardy green herbs each summer, although my dogs are in the process of trying to dig those up, um, and barely check the explosive growth of the mint, which they seem to completely ignore, that I mistakenly allowed to take root in that box a few years ago. I've never been able to keep a rose bush alive for a second season, and even my hydrangeas don't bloom all the way. All of which is more shameful because my grandmother, Nana, Eleanor Goodman, Alea Shalom, was an excellent gardener. I live one block from the house that she and my grandfather kept while I was a small child, and most of my salient, not most, but many of my salient memories of her include plants. There was a thundercloud plum tree that was in the semicircle between the half moon driveway and the sidewalk. There were the raspberry bushes out back that made the fruit for my favorite pie ever. But many of her favorite plants were not on Dalzell Place. They were right here. So Nana was a docent both at Phipps Conservatory and here at the Biblical Garden at Road of Shalom for what seemed like forever. I knew Phipps firsthand from all the times she helped arrange school field trips for my class, and either she or her friends took us around and taught us things. I still have some of the faded Polaroids from those trips that I took with my very first camera. Rodif was less familiar. This garden lived mostly in the stories that she told when she came home to tell me about the time she spent working here, leading tours, and about her friend Irene Jacob who she always spoke about with great reverence and respect and a huge smile. Best of all for her were the times when she got to tell me about a brand new plant, something special that they had managed to procure to add to the collection. Nana knew about gardens, me not so much. 
But I know a thing or two about the garden, the one in Eden, that I want to share with you this evening in keeping with our theme. So ask most people what they know about the Garden of Eden, and they'll tell you there were two important trees. One was the Tree of Life, and when Adam and Eve ate from it, they were sustained in something approaching immortality. The other, the one they weren't supposed to touch, was the Tree of Knowledge. Knowledge of what, you ask? Of how to articulate your words, to start with. Remember, this was the tree that God said, don't eat the fruit. Did God mean for them to remain ignorant? No, the Torah tells us it wasn't the tree of all knowledge, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, that prohibition doesn't make sense. Why else did God create human beings if not to be able to freely make moral decisions? Humans are supposed to be created in God's image. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. As we're told in multiple different places in Torah and in other scriptures as well. And one of the things that defines God's uniqueness, especially in contrast to the capricious, arbitrary gods of pagan religions of that time, is a moral compass, one that humans are supposed to emulate. Without the ability to tell right from wrong, how could any humans, Israelite or otherwise, ever receive the Torah and do anything useful with it? If Torah was part of the plan all along, the blueprint of the universe, existing from the moment even before creation, how could God have intended to keep such fruit out of the hands of the people that are supposed to receive it? So in his posthumously published book of Torah commentary called Studies in Spirituality, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs takes the question one step further. Did not, I'm not going to try his accent. It was absolutely magical to listen to and is probably not something I can duplicate. Did not Adam and Eve already have this knowledge before eating the fruit, he asks? Surely this was implied in the very fact that they were commanded by God. Be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over nature. Do not eat from the tree. For someone to obey a command, they must know it is good to obey and bad to disobey. But if the tree didn't bestow knowledge of right and wrong, what did it impart to those who ate its fruit? To answer this question, Rabbi Sachs turns to Maimonides and the Guide for the Perplexed. Maimonides also assumes that the first humans knew right from wrong. What they lacked and what the tree's fruit provided was the knowledge of things generally accepted. We know what that means. Think of the novels, or if you can stomach it, which I certainly can't, the TV series Game of Thrones. The handmaidens in the caravan and the ones that attend to the horse warriors constantly tell Daenerys, it is known, Khaleesi. No source, no citation. It's just known. When I was growing up, I read a few of Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House on the Prairie novels. Those are a lot easier on the stomach. In one of them, Pa grows some watermelons. Sometime later, there is an outbreak of a contagious disease that the locals on the prairie call fever and og, whatever that might be today. Probably not COVID-19. Some tries... Someone tries to blame Paul Ingalls watermelons, to which he replies, Everyone knows that fever and og is caused by the night air. Well, retorts the accuser, them watermelons was grown in the night air. It is known. And if someone proves you wrong, just move the cheese a little bit so everyone will still be right. But Maimonides means more than local folk wisdom when he says things generally known. So in chapter 2 of Genesis, God plants the two trees in the garden, and the second tree we're told, is the tree of knowledge of good and bad. The Hebrew is very straightforward. Tov, vara, good and bad. It's unambiguous. But Onkelos, who was a second century convert to Judaism, who spoke Aramaic and, learned, and translated the Torah into Aramaic so that his friends and family could learn all of this cool stuff that he was learning, he used a different word to translate ra, bad or evil. He said, vish, which is from the root bet yud shin, which in Hebrew means shame or embarrassment. So according to Onkelos, it wasn't the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was the tree of knowledge of what is good and what is shameful. So that distinction matters because of what happens next. In chapter 3, we see the servant, the servant, the serpent. I really need to work on this articulation thing if I'm going to speak in public. He goads Adam and Eve into eating from the tree despite the prohibition. He finishes the exhortation by saying, in temptation, the ultimate prize. As soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, 
and you will be like Elohim. One could easily read this, and the serpent clearly hoped it would be read this way, as you will be like God. But once they eat the fruit, they don't feel godlike, they feel fearful. They realize they're naked, and they run and hide because they hear the voice of God coming towards them in the garden. When they explain to God why they've hidden in fear, God says, Who told you you were naked? Onkelos renders the word Elohim into Aramaic as Ravivin Chakimin, Great Wise Ones. Maimonides points out that Elohim doesn't have to mean God. It can mean angels, judges, rulers of countries, not just God. Great wise ones, as Onkelos puts it, of knowledge acquired from years of living and experience. The stuff everyone knows if they stick around long enough. Among the things everyone knows is that being naked is shameful. Adam and Eve didn't know that before. Maimonides reasons they knew a lot of things. They knew necessary truths. Facts that were observable, about which you wouldn't say good or bad, just true or false. And they were able to reason from these facts and follow commandments, knowing that following God's commandment was good and disobeying was bad. What they didn't understand, Maimonides says, was apparent truths, moral reasoning like knowing that being naked was improper among civilized people. Once they realized this truth, they knew that shame for the first time, and they feared being seen in their naked state. They feared being exposed and revealed. Here, too, Onkelos' translation is really helpful. So the serpent opens the final line of his temptation by saying, God knows that you will become like God if you eat this fruit. Presumably what he means is, God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because God doesn't want to share this power with you. That's the classic MO of a bad actor who's trying to sow distrust between two people who like each other. But Onkelos changes that God knows to Galei Kadam Hashem. It is apparent or revealed or exposed before God. The word Gimel Lamed means to reveal or to expose, to uncover. Almost like saying, go ahead, eat it. You'll be like the great wise ones, but you'll also be completely exposed before your creator. From where there is no hiding. I basically spent my entire career from the second year of medical school, trying to move away from the use of shame as a tool. Um, one of my secular mentors from afar, Dr. Bernard Lohn, who actually died just a few months after Rabbi Sachs passed, he was just shy of 100 years old, and he wrote a book called The Lost Art of Healing. In his book, there were two chapters, words that maim and words that heal. Highly ranked about, among the words that maim were words that cause a person to feel shame. Medicine has long inflicted shame upon people for their weight, their lack of knowledge, their behavior that contributed to their illness, their parenting, their ethnic background. Laun argues for a different set of words, words which are positive, which are constructive, and do their own healing work even before we prescribe a treatment. Rabbi Sachs provides the reasoning behind those words. So in his later works, he comes back to this theme over and over again that there are two major types of cultures guilt cultures and shame cultures. Now that's not his formulation. It comes from a post-World War II book by a woman named Ruth Benedict, who was an anthropologist, uh, I believe called The Sword and the Chrysanthemum. Uh, I, this is one of his favorite sources to quote, and so he comes back to her quite often. Guilt cultures teach that certain actions are right and certain actions are wrong, and when one performs a wrong action, they should feel guilty. They should recognize that the action was wrong and a desire, an obligation, to set things right, what we would call in Hebrew, tshuva. The morality that Adam, that's, that every time I say something worthwhile, it goes off. <laughs> it's, val it's validating me. It's like sneezing. <laughs> um, somebody else will take care of the sneezing. The morality that Adam and Eve already knew and that's reinforced over those two millennia that, that came after in the biblical narrative is a guilt morality. Shame morality, on the other hand, is that a person performing a wrong action recognizes that they are wrong, that they've been exposed to everyone else as a bad person. They can't go out, they can't speak publicly, their families are marked and stigmatized. Shame can't be assuaged by setting things right, it can only be ended by disappearing or by hiding. We bring another commentator, Rabbeinu Bachia. He was a couple centuries after Maimonides, and he imagined Adam and Eve as being created with superior intellect from the beginning. We read, in our divine image. 
Bachia describes Adam's intellect as totally spiritually oriented. Now, to me, that makes him sound like what the classical economists call the so-called rational actor. We'll talk about what a rational actor is and why it doesn't exist later on. He and Eve are unaware of their bodily desires. They consider all their organs, the sexual ones and otherwise, in the same kind of indifferent way. Once they eat the fruit, though, they're conscious of urges and desires that they hadn't considered before. Bachia says that at that point, he was immediately punished by being stripped of his ability to use his intellect objectively. There's one of those other words that we imagine actually has real meaning. From that moment on, considerations such as physical desire, appreciation of physical beauty or ugliness clouded his previously pure intellect. So the punishment, according to Bachia and according to Maimonides, is not just the end of Adam and Eve's immortality. Instead, it's the acquisition of one kind of wisdom at the expense of God-given intelligence. Created as perfectly rational beings, the entry of everyone knows that wisdom and consideration of desire into their minds means that their reason was now diminished. Instead of considering only the truth and falsity of a question, they're now considering how it's going to affect their goals. What other people will think of their decisions? What will the neighbors think? <coughs> there weren't any neighbors at the time, so I don't know what they were worried about. Um, and how the objective truth squared with their view of, quote, the way everyone knows the world works. In other words, they became fully human. In doing so, they also became capable of shame. It's often when someone else lays bare our pursuit of our desires for alcohol, for sex with the wrong person, the wrong person, for too much food that we feel the most shame. At those times, our first impulse is to cover up, to bury the evidence, and hide. <clears throat> And now it's a break for water. So about four years ago, I published the book that Julie held up to show you. The premise is rooted in Genesis. Just one chapter before this whole narrative started about the garden, that if humans are created in the divine image, then people who come to the doctor or any other healthcare provider and the people they're coming to see are both created in the divine image. You have a pair of people with that image, looking at each other, sitting with each other, working together. And as long as they see each other in that way, there's a certain kind of covenant between them that calls for certain kinds of behavior. Attentive listening, respectful but incisive questioning, carefully chosen healing words like Dr. Lown talked about, things that will elucidate the problem and lead them together to a response. And again, giving credit where credit is due, the idea of covenant between healer and patient is not mine. That's Rabbi Harold Schulweis. Uh, I was probably only a couple years old when he wrote that originally. So uh, <clears throat> again, I'm saying it in the name of the one who said it first. The question and the subject of the second half of the book, though, is the real challenge, which is why doesn't this happen most of the time? And based on my reading of Lown's work on words that shame, words that maim, shaming is one of the reasons. Not episodic shaming, using shaming words on a particular education, but habitual shaming, what we would call stigmatization. There are certain behaviors, membership in certain groups, that carry such negative connotations that I titled my chapter on stigma, Losing the Human Image. They say that you never really understand something until you teach it. So here is the first of what I believe are three things that I'm going to say tonight to you, or shall I say yins, uh, this evening, that speaking this evening have clarified for me. Thing number one, eating the forbidden fruit, supposedly in pursuit of being more like God, put humans in the danger of seeing themselves and other humans as not being like God any longer. The very thing that set them apart from all the rest of creation was at risk. The ability to shame and be shamed at their logical extreme mean the ability to lower a person to a point where they no longer seem human. This has been explicit plenty of times throughout history. During the Shoah, in Rwanda, in Burma today. But it's also implicit in the negative self-talk that people who are suffering from depression or psychosis at their extremes feel about themselves. It's in the othering and excluding of people with disabilities visible and hidden and even in the routine treatment of people coming to seek healing and medical care whose time, dignity, intelligence, and personal needs are regarded as immaterial and not worth worrying about. 
One problem with losing the human image is that it's really hard to get back. Things generally known often include things like, everyone knows he's a drunk. So a couple of weeks ago, I met a young man who came from an immigrant community, and having arrived in the States as a teenager, found himself in trouble a lot. He enrolled in a lot of programs for at-risk youth in a number of different places, and made heavy use of alcohol and other recreational drugs. About five years ago, after a move from one city to another, his substance use hit a peak that he realized could not continue. So other than one reunion with old friends, he's been completely abstinent since then. Unfortunately, that's also meant he's been mostly isolated from his community. The memory of his rough adolescence and his young adulthood endures, and everyone knows that he's that kind of person. My community's very conservative, he told me, and once you're like that, they think you can never change. So he keeps to himself, choosing books and quiet over the community that can only see him in one light. Health professionals engage in the same behavior, aided and abetted by the use of medical records. Um, I guess this is the meaning that we're using them for in meaningful use. Especially in the electronic age, words that appear in someone's chart tend to propagate from visit to visit, and not just because people are cutting and pasting. One institution to another. One provider reads another's note, internalizes language, and repeats it, consciously or unconsciously. When one note contains words like difficult, non-compliant, poor historian. By the way, I was always taught there are no patients who are poor historians. There are plenty of clinicians who are poor history takers, but not, not the other way around. Or drug seeking. The next note is highly likely to use them as well. Or to use more subdued language, that amounts to the same thing. Pretty soon, everyone knows not to believe what this person tells them or to keep their defenses up and plan to say no even before the question gets asked. One of the most interesting words that we throw around in medical charts is often applied to family members of patients. It's the word unrealistic. It usually concerns their expectations of how likely a relative with a life-limiting illness is to survive and recover. And I want to use this word to illustrate the second thing I've learned, or maybe realized is a better word in preparing for this talk. Um, I, I will coin the term the Edenic fallacy or the Eden fallacy. What is the Eden fallacy? It goes like this. In the Garden of Eden, prior to eating the fruit, human beings were immortal. The fruit of the tree of life was designed to keep them alive forever. In the U.S., we subscribe to the following fallacy. The mistaken belief that we are still supposed to live forever and that death is a failure of will or in tech speak, it is a bug, not a feature. This part of the fallacy isn't new for me, and it's not news to any of you. The only thing that's changed about it in the last 50 years is that 50 years ago, most doctors subscribed to it completely. It was the golden age of medicine, golden age of therapeutics anyway. They had convinced themselves that they could fix anything. In the past 20 years or so, we've come back to earth a little bit. There's been a rise in the disciplines of palliative care and hospice, and it's brought most of the profession, and I say most for a reason, into the realization that while there are many previously incurable things that are no longer incurable, sooner or later, there's a limit we can't exceed. Many of the people that we treat, however, don't buy it, and often suspect we are holding out on them when we talk about limits of care. We only have ourselves to blame. Our irrational exuberance, to borrow another term from economics, got them to buy in. And while we may have sobered up, the rest of society has not. Not yet, anyway. When they engage in the exact same wishful thinking, the same irrational exuberance that we had not so long ago, we label them unrealistic. Oh, did I say irrational? So I did. Which brings me to the second part of the fallacy, the new wrinkle. You'll remember that Rabbeinu Bachya, who was the, the second commentator that came a couple of hundred years after Maimonides, described pre-fruit-eating humans, that's fruit with a capital F, they ate other fruit before that, but not this fruit, um, as totally spiritual beings, akin to the mythical rational actor. I told you we were going to come back to that rational actor. So the other part of the fallacy is that we believe humans are still rational actors, making logical, detached decisions, or at least that we should still be such actors. Anyone who isn't should be, well, ashamed for letting their desires, and especially their base desires for sex and intoxication, cloud their judgment. Health professionals certainly behave as though we believe our patients should be like that. 
Now, I said classical economists love the idea of the rational actor and base most of their conclusions on the assumption that the average member of society was such a person. Not surprisingly, these conclusions often fail to explain all sorts of chaotic illogical events in the economy. So it took the new field of behavioral economics, you've heard of Kahneman and Tversky and many others that are uh, continuing to add to this field, including the free economics guys, Dubner and Levitt and all sorts of other folks, among others, to point out that there was no such thing as a rational actor any more than there is such a thing as a physics river. Anybody know what a physics river is? Physics river, which I learned about at our alma mater, Taylor Alderdice High School. Uh, <laughs> nope, sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't a high school thing. It was a post-college post thing. A physics river has perfectly parallel banks, perfectly uniform depth, and a perfectly even current that never varies. There is no such thing as a physics river, but it makes it much easier to do a physics problem about a flowing river. People's perceptions, emotions, and secondary desires, like vengeful punishment of freeloaders in an experiment, often cause them to directly act counter to their own rational best interests. And like in many other areas, the health professions, the only major industry to still use the fax machine, is lagging behind the economists and getting wise to the idea. What's perhaps less surprising is that health professionals, like classical economists and probably a lot of behavioral economists, and maybe even Moses Maimonides himself, believe themselves to be rational actors. Sure, we can allow that the patients have turbulent emotions and that their judgment is clouded by those big feelings or by pain or by the drugs that we've given them to relieve the pain. We can understand that their family members are grief-stricken, can't make wise decisions, but we, the professionals, we were trained by the great Sir William Osler in what's called equanimitas, the professional detachment, the cool rationality that allows us to settle decisively on the truth without wavering. It's such detachment that allows us to always prescribe the appropriate drug for our patients while we block out all the noise of those promotional drug items that are sitting on our desks from the drug reps. While our less rational colleagues down the hall are hopelessly compromised for accepting the same kind of swag. So. <laughs> Rabbeinu Bachia was the mystic in this group, so rather than the rational actor Maimonides, he reminds us of what's really going on. In this non-Eden world that we live in, all sorts of things have clouded our previously pure intellect. Patients, families, and providers alike are driven by a bubbling stew of facts, opinions, emotions, and physical urges, each one of us trying to resolve all that data into a coherent path according to our own unique set of priorities. But stop for a minute and consider what it would be like if we weren't. That bubbling stew sounds a lot more human than that entirely spiritual, rational being that we were talking about from before the snake came along. If anything, Adam before the fruit sounds a lot more Vulcan than human. So that brings me to the third thing that I think I've learned or realized in preparing this talk. And that is that I don't think the Torah meant for us to see the eating of the fruit as a sin or what happened afterwards as a punishment. I think it was part of the plan all along, a step in the process of creating fully human beings, just like the separation of Adam into gendered individuals, or the initial statement of let us make human beings in our image. The image of God in chapter one of Genesis refers to awareness, intellectual and spiritual awareness. These are beings that can think and understand, but there's something lacking in a being with only those two components. And something that we know God also does is feel and have feelings about what's good and bad. Creation is good. Each part of creation is good. It says so every single day. Tuesday, it says it twice. And all of the parts together, as we learn at the end of the sixth day, are very good. What's not good, in God's opinion, is loneliness. The first time God speaks of an ungood thing, yes, that I borrowed from George Orwell. You won't hear that one again is when God declares, Lo tov hi ot adam levad, it is not good for the Adam to be alone. What does God know from loneliness? Well, according to the mystical tradition, God was so lonely that this infinite being actually self-limited and withdrew from the boundless universe to create empty space into which the universe could explode and expand so that there would be space for there to be human beings that could eventually be partners with the divine. 
the Adam didn't go to God and say, hey, God, I'm lonely. God anticipated that it wouldn't be good for Adam to be alone. It wouldn't have even occurred to Adam to say in that space to know what lonely was. He was in the garden and everything was fine. He had no desires yet. So God is already foreseeing, even before the snake's forked tongue begins darting in and out, that Adam will become aware of needs and of wants and of desires and yes, of loneliness. The God that created the donkey of Bil'am thousands of years before it would be needed for the narrative also created this option for Adam to know about loneliness and what to do about it. A mate, someone to be both a helper and a confronter when the time was necessary to confront Adam when he was doing something stupid. So maybe the verse, you will be like Elohim, knowing good and bad, doesn't mean angels. Angels don't think, they don't feel, and they don't know good from bad. In fact, the 19th century commentator, the Natsiv, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, it was his acronym, um, wrote a commentary called Ha'amek Davar, and when he comments on this particular verse in there, he says, you know, the verse may mean that they become like angels because angels serve God, their mission is their existence, and once the angel has completed its task, it ceases to exist. But that doesn't sound very human uh, or a very good description of human mortality either. Because in one lifetime, we can serve God in many different ways. And for better or for worse, we can abandon divine service altogether and still live for many more years. If that weren't true, the Torah would be a very short book. I do think that Elohim in that sentence means like God. So up until now, you've been content, able to understand facts, even abstractly understand do's and don'ts, have a rational, simplistic view of right and wrong. I'm in the middle of binge watching the show The Good Place right now. I'm about two thirds of the way through. I promise not to spoil too much for anybody. But the character Chidi in the show The Good, has anybody here watched The Good Place? Okay, we've, we've, got, one, we've got one fan. So he is a moral philosophy professor um, in his life. And in the afterlife, we learn that he is a devotee of Immanuel Kant and he espouses the categorical imperative that if a principle is right, it is right all the time for all the people in all the situations. The most salient principle for him specific to that is not lying, telling the truth. So during his life and for the first third or so of the series, he is unable to lie, unable to conceive of any relationship to the truth other than he has to tell it and tell all of it all the time. Remind me never to invite him to a wedding or tell him where any of the fugitives are hiding. Either way, his rigid binary approach to morals feels like what the morality of the Adam must have been like before he ate the fruit. But to be really like Elohim, God couldn't, eh, God, to be really like Elohim, like God, Adam couldn't stay in that binary. Adam and Eve and all of humanity after them had to know what else was in the mind of God, and that's emotions. Feelings like anger, betrayal and disappointment, but also like love and joy and longing. The contentment of the Garden of Eden wasn't godlike. These emotions, even the negative ones, the ones that were taught actually are at the root of all creative things that people do, were what made humans really resemble their creator. And understand that good and bad was much more layered, shaded, than they could possibly understand before. Even the punishments that God hands out as they're leaving the garden, painful childbirth, toiling for food, those lead to the greatest joys of human existence. Offspring, bountiful harvests, so when, spoiler alert, Michael decides to torture Chidi, he does it by putting him through realistic enactments of the trolley problem, an ethical puzzle where both choices involve sacrificing one or more lives to save one or more other lives. Good and bad aren't binary. The whole of rabbinic Judaism is dedicated to navigating situations where two imperatives conflict or the lines of demarcation between here and there have gotten fuzzy. And if you know the old Alan Sherman Opus, you know, to laugh about fuzzy demarcation, the pit boss. Nobody knows that joke. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to have to retire that one. So the messy logic and rationalization that human beings have is a feature, not a bug, after all. If only we were able to remember that and not continue acting as though we are still running Human Being 1.0, the Eden edition. If humans are created in the divine image, and the original plan for that creation was always to eventually have them eat the fruit, that both made them mortal and yet also made them more like Elohim. The end result of eating the fruit was going from Vulcan Adam to messy human Eve and Adam, then as follows, regarding another human being, 
made in the divine image, means embracing both their intellect, which is unique among the creatures on earth, and the emotion, which is unique not only among creatures, but between each individual and the next. And even when the morass of human caprice and frailty is maddening, as healers, we can't turn away because that's what human beings are. This is what God is, and we are seeing the face of God one unique iteration at a time. The most godlike feature we have is the need for connection, the need not to be lonely. So this explains my willingness to engage in nonlinear discussions, nonlinear logic, nonlinear outcomes. It also explains why the working relationship between healer and person is primary in my work, ahead of diagnosis, ahead of medication reconciliation, which I actually hate because it's so tedious. Um, and it explains why I pick up and use often discarded data like stories, emotions, and traditions. The most godlike feature we have is the need for connection, and it takes a lot more than a list of symptoms or a medication list to make that connection. But think of the challenges facing medicine in terms of, the, in terms of this fallacy. The lack of sufficient time for meaningful encounters. Messy human Eve and Adam take time to relate to. They have needs and desires that others may find shameful or laughable, but that are only human. They do not think linearly, and they do not crunch evidence like computers, even if they have advanced degrees and profess rationality. If only their healers, the professionals who care for them, could see that. Or, to take Rabbi Sachs's approach, hear that. Because when he returns to the ideas that shame cultures are visual, concerned with how we appear to others, he links the shame that Adam and Eve feel after eating the fruit to their reliance on their eyes, on seeing that the tree is attractive before eating the fruit. And the serpent preys on the visual as well by pointing out that they didn't die when they touched the tree. But guilt cultures like Judaism are based on hearing. We hear commandments, we hear teachings, and perhaps most importantly, we hear stories and narratives and emotions. When we err, it is our actions that are wrong, not our persons, and we begin our journey back into the community by speaking words, confession, apology, being honest with ourselves and those we hurt with our wrong actions. We then listen to guidance about how to change and how not to behave when the circumstances repeat themselves as they always do. A, he a healing culture is a hearing culture. And while physical examination and use of all the senses is critical to the practice of medicine, Dr. Lown taught that 75% of the correct diagnosis, and for me, 95% of the relationship, comes through getting a careful history, which involves asking just the right set of questions and sitting back to listen attentively to the answer. A healing culture is a hearing culture, not a seeing one. We don't look at the shame or the stigma, only at the person carrying its burden. And a healing culture is a hearing culture that listens to the emotions and the anguish and the indecision and still finds a way forward. So lest you think that I'm suggesting that healing is just about accommodating all of people's desires and whatever mess we encounter and letting it go, even if that ultimately generates harm, remember that when we talk about the emotion that humans have that made them even more in God's image, well, when God displays emotion, what do the human beings do? They call God out. Abraham says to God, hey, those people in stone, there might be some righteous people in Sodom. You should really think about them before you destroy the city. Moses, when God gets angry and is threatening to destroy the people and start over, says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Do you want to give the Egyptians the last laugh? That's not a rational thought that God would necessarily have, but it's a consideration. Samuel even pleads with God to, uh, to smack the people around when they ask for a king, and God answers not with a rational argument, but with resignation. They've rejected me, not you. Let them have their king. Healers can stand strong in the face of emotion if we recognize that we're in this together. We're in a covenant. We have to accept and honor each other's irrationality. Me treating the last patient I saw with this problem and not the one in front of me. You being disproportionately fearful of something that's very, very uncommon. We both have it. God tells Cain, sin crouches at the door, but you can be its master. Our messes can get really, really messy. And to paraphrase Tevye, it's no sin to be a mess, but it's no great honor either. Healing's about respectfully recognizing that we all have mess and respectfully urging one another to start cleaning it up. One of my favorite people that I've seen over the years, um, I would take this literally in their case. 
The whole time I've known them, they've had this delightful, sunny, gregarious personality, and it is covering over a deep vegetative depression that keeps them from getting up, showering, cleaning up the clutter, or washing the dishes. Shaming them about the condition of their apartment wasn't the answer. Encouragement, validating that the mess is there without endorsing the mess continuing to be there was the answer. And it worked. So you may wonder, as we get close to the end, why I'm sharing this message in a garden and not at a medical conference. So among the many hard lessons that we've all learned in these last 30 months is that we are all likely to be called on at some point to be healers. Doesn't matter how many capital letters, including if it's zero, we have after our names. There's been a huge exodus, I don't know if you're aware, from the medical and nursing professions. Primary care was already, already woefully short on providers, and there are probably more resignations on the horizon. I was driving to work this morning, and there's a billboard on Bates Street in Oakland that says 93% of hospital workers are thinking about leaving their jobs. Now, that was from the SEIU, that's the Service Employees Union, which represents many of those workers, so there might have been an exaggeration. But even if it was nearly double, that's still about half of the hospital workers. That's scary. The gap in mental health services, that's beyond critical, and it's been that way for a long time. Our individual and community connections and informal healers like peer support specialists, community health workers, and people who have no title at all are going to be more critical than ever. They're going to be the Streganonas, like in the storybook, or Aunt Esther in the August Wilson plays that people go to when they need help. We're going to be much more effective in that role, meaning everybody who's not standing up here and who doesn't have the fancy letters, if we remember that our neighbors and loved ones are created in the divine image, so are we. But that means that we are all complicated, multi-layered, decidedly non-Vulcan beings, and so are we. So that brings me back to the beginning, not the beginning with a capital B, but the beginning of my talk. When I moved into the house, I tasted the first grape to ripen, and it had such tough skin and such large seeds that I knew I wasn't going to eat it. So for the first five years in the house, I had firmly believed that I could make grape juice which would taste just like Kedem Kosher grape juice served at Kiddush and Shabbat dinner nationwide. And sure enough, the juice I made my first year was sour. I mean, we're talking like Fox and Aesop's fables sour. So the next year, though my dear Rabbi Seth Adelson was kind enough to drink a full glass and proclaim its fi fine qualities, it was sour. <laughs> and the following year. So finally, over my irrational insistence that I would get it right with a few more tweaks, I heard the subtext of my children and wife telling me it was awful, really more text than subtext, <laughs> and read between the lines of Rabbi Adelson's kindness, actually subtext, that grape juice was a bad idea. As God told Moshe at the waters of Mara, don't complain about the bitterness of the water, do something to make it sweet. So I listened. I added sugar and pectin and a little bit of earth balance because that gets rid of the froth. And I made really fabulous grape jelly every year since then. The goal of this whole endeavor of healing is not to help people live forever. That's the Eden fallacy also. And we're all wise enough to know now that the mortality is built in. But the Eden dream? That's something else that the prophet Micah shared with us long ago. And there is a segue here. The dream of Eden, according to Micha, is V'yashvu ish tachat gafno v'tachat te'enato ve'en machrid. They shall sit every person under their vine and under their fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. If I can help someone, even for a moment, achieve this degree of peace, or if you can do the same, with all the physical and emotional forces pushing them into distress, then we're doing our job. So thank you for listening. Um, since I finished with my vine for the year, I'm going to go find a spot under the fig tree and answer any questions you might have. <laughs> thank you. So. There is no microphone under the fig tree. That was just a, a little rhetorical flourish. I will be happy to take any questions, um, and I will repeat them so that the people that didn't hear them coming up can hear them going back. I apologize to the people online. We don't have any way for you to submit questions, but uh, the email address is winkle, W-E-I-N-K-L-E, -E, at healerswholisten.com, so you can email them to me. But for the audience here. I was taught to wait 30 seconds in silence, so I'm just going to wait a few more seconds. Okay. Tammy.
Great. So Tammy asked the question uh, after outing herself as somebody who comes to see me and my partners. Um, how much of this is in the front of your mind when you're seeing your own patients uh, with everything else that's going on and all of the, the time and additional pressures, including people knocking on the door, needing my attention somewhere else? Um, so I'll start with my mess, which is I don't sleep very well. Usually I'm pretty hung I'm hungry nearly all the time. That's just the way my body works. And I have lots of different things that I need to be accountable for because I'm usually the person in charge of two or three of the other providers in the office in addition to myself. I wrote this book and published it four years ago because I have really, I, I genuinely try to push myself no matter what kind of a mess I'm in to do these things. To rem to remember not to lose my temper, to remember not to dismiss um, somebody's emotional state, not to dismiss somebody's uh, concerns about things, no matter how odd they seem to me, no matter how irrational they seem. I am really attempting to do this. Um, and I'm attempting to teach my students to do this as well. Those, those of you who do come to see me uh, have probably you notice that there are almost always students, not just from Chatham, but also from Pitt in our office all the time. Um, and in the back when I'm not in front of a patient, I will often comment on language that they used, or here's a w different way you could ask that question, or pay attention to this nonverbal cue the next time. Um, we really are working that way. And I, and I, I want to be very clear that it's not just me, right? This is part of the reason that I feel comfortable working where I do is because the health center espouses this ethos as well. Um, it doesn't, and those of you who come there will know, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and it is hard to keep it that way at every stage of the game, both among the providers and among the nurses and among the people answering the phones, especially with the frustrations of the last two and a half years. And we've had some additional challenges that aren't pandemic related on top of that. But I really do try. And I'm certain that on a daily basis, I fail at least a few people in that regard and that's the chuva that I have to keep doing, the, the, the work that I have to keep working on. Julie. As patients, mm -hmm. what do you recommend us to be able to mm. talk with providers to get them to listen? Sure. Um, I will as soon as I'm ready to answer it, because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to start talking and then there'll be another long silence. OK, so Julie's question is, as patients, so if you are somebody who is not in a healing profession or a healing position, but you're looking for help, what's something that you can do to get the person who's helping you to listen clearly? Um, it really helps to, for starters, come in with your agenda clear in your mind. Um, even things that you may be a little bit embarrassed about, um, and I, I will give an example of that in a moment, but to come in with an agenda, and one that seems manageable. Even somebody who has all the time in the world, um, there's a concept that I got from emergency medicine called cognitive load. And even the best, fastest, most capable emergency physician has a limit to how much cognitive load they can take on in one visit. Um, I can do about three things really well in any visit. I can do five things pretty well, and beyond five, I'm kind of a mess. I'm guaranteed to forget at least one of the things if I go over five. Um, the fewer things that we want to spend time on, the deeper I can listen to each of those things. And so if you have an agenda, and if your agenda includes, let's say, paperwork that needs to be completed, lead with whatever's on your mind. Um, second thing is, I know there's a power dynamic, and I know it's really hard to push back on that, but it is okay to say, I don't think you heard me, or I said this thing because it's important. Now, you're all here because you are activated, careful listeners, you have lots of interests. People who are not in quite the educated, speaking the same language, having the degrees and the qualifications position that you are, may not even realize that they have a thing that's really bothering them. They may not be able to articulate it. My job is to look at those things and pick up that there's something that they can't articulate, that something's not connecting. But 
the last piece of my advice to Julie would be if you feel like the answer you got wasn't the answer to the question that you asked, even if it was the right answer to some question, point out the disconnect. Um, it won't always work. Um, one of the things that I've learned the hard way through doing this work is that I can only promise somebody that I'm taking care of with regard to my own behavior and my own actions. I cannot promise anybody else's actions are going to live up to a standard that I set. Um, by the same token, I can't necessarily promise that my actions are going to live up to somebody else's standard uh, because certainly I'm not the best in the world at this. I'm just the one standing up here talking about it. Anything else? This is the second 30 second wait until I get to. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your evening to come and, and listen and to sit in this beautiful garden, which I am now going to go look for the fig tree. Um, and I hope to talk to you individually soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Again, thank you, Jonathan, for such a wonderful, thoughtful talk on both religion and how to look at what we need as human beings. I'm curious to know what takeaways some people have had. My number one takeaway was that we all can feel lonely at times and that community is so critical. So with that said, we do welcome everybody here to walk through the garden tonight or come back and everybody online in and outside of Pittsburgh. We hope to see you either this year we close on September 15th or come back next year when we're open June 1st to September 15th. And yes, I'm going to be the marketer and show the books again. So the books for our garden are $10. Jonathan's books tonight are $18, and you can order them via Amazon as well. His books, not our books. They are cheaper in person tonight. Thank you.